Good afternoon, everybody. We're really excited that, that we've got a full house for this workshop. I think Dr. Polanini set us up. Um, and I'm so glad you guys are all here to hear about these exciting clinical trials that we're going to talk about today. Um, this is a, a really exciting time with a lot of new results coming out within, during this North American. And these are just four examples of some of the trials you've been hearing about today and yesterday that have really neat and inspiring new results that are going to take us into the, the next generation. So um, I appreciate everybody being here. Um, as per all the other workshops and symposia that you have been at, you have to ask your questions on the app on the phone. Please do that. Jot them down. Ask them while the speakers are, are speaking, and, uh, and we'll get those up here and be able to read those out loud. I know not everybody likes that. Um, we have a small enough room that hopefully we can hear you if you have a question and want to just stand up and give us a question afterwards. We will certainly entertain that. And, um, and Kathy and I will definitely repeat those questions so that everybody can hear them. Uh, so please, uh, please engage, and uh, we're really excited about this, about this session. So I get to have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker today. Um, I get to introduce Dr. Felix Ratchin, who is the division head um, at the University of Toronto Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Well, thank you. So according to the schedule, my talk is going to be for the next two hours. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Sit back and relax. <laughs> so sorry for that. If I can ever get this going. So let's see. Uh, yeah, okay. So that, that, that should do it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Um, so that is me, and actually I have somewhat more gray hair now than on this picture. <laughs> but I, I don't keep on changing it. Um, so what I, what I, my disclosures, I, I, the only disclosure that I have because I'm talking about ETI is that I act as a consultant to Vertex Pharmaceutical, so I wanted to mention that. And what I'm going to talk about today is the effectiveness um, of Alexacafta, Tazacafta, Avacafta in children with cystic fibrosis. And this is the pediatric PROMISE study. And I'm on, only going to talk about the pulmonary outcomes. Uh, and there are lots of other outcomes that we are looking at at, at this study. We have a, gr a great team of people that are involved in this study. And uh, I get to talk, uh, I get to present these data in, uh, for, for this whole group of people. And the three PIs for this study are Jessica Pittman, Margaret Rosenfeld, and myself. And um, before I start to go into the details of the study, I just wanted to address the issue, why do we need these uh, real-world effectiveness studies when, when we have uh, data from these clinical trials that tell us about the efficacy of, uh, of the drugs that are move for, moving forward in the pipeline? And, and one of the important components of that is that um, if we think about the clinical trials, they, they certainly are well controlled, and that's one of the advantages. But they don't necessarily represent the whole population that, in, that you treat in the clinic afterwards. And that includes inclusion criteria for the trials, upper limits for lung function, and therefore the, uh, the signal that you get in the real-life scenario might be quite different from what you see in the clinical trial. And also, um, it might be different in terms of the uh, expectations that people need to have in terms of what the, what the effect is. And that's important to understand because if we, if we see the, the wonderful results of uh, ETI treatment, uh, and some of our patients may not be totally convinced that what they see in terms of their numbers and their um, changes over time is quite as convincing of, from the clinical trials. So, um, so let's just go into the rationale of, of this pediatric sub-study. Um, so ETI is, a, um, is, I don't need to tell you what ETI is. It's a, <laughs> <laughs> if you haven't slept through the whole conference, you probably know what ETI is. So it's a, <laughs> but I'm still going to say it. So it's a CFTR modulator combination. It's approved for patients six and older. And there are some exciting data for the two to five year old group now that are also presented here. Um, and um, so the PROMISE study is an ongoing U.S. multicenter observational prospective cohort study that's quite a mouthful, examining efficacy in the, or effectiveness in the post-approval real-world setting amongst people with CF prescribed ETI clinically. 
Um, and so what I can report today are preliminary six months follow-up data for the pediatric sub-study. Um, so it's not a complete data set yet. And I think a, one, it's a, a study like that, an observational study, is like a good bottle of red wine. The, the longer you keep it, the better it's going to be. So the longer we run the study, the more important data will come out of it. So this is just a first glimpse at the data, and you will see more during the, during the upcoming years. So the methodology for this study is relatively simple. So for, for to be included in these studies, children had to have a diagnosis of CF, at least one ETI responsive uh, a CFTR variant, and be in the adequate age group, which is 6 to under 12. Right? And the older, 12 and older group are part of the, um, of the uh, core PROMISE study, and you've, you've heard some results of that, and some of that is already pu published in the Blue Journal. In this case, because we were looking at the younger age group, the primary outcome in terms of the pulmonate, um, 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 uh, pulmonary function measures, it was the lung clearance index measured by multiple breath washout. And you again heard quite a bit of that during this meeting, and it's becoming more and more of an established outcome measure, for, uh, especially for pediatric patients. But as lung function improves in, in older patients with CF as well, we will see more of that move, uh, outcome measure also moving into studies in these age groups. Um, a number of secondary output, uh, uh, Outcomes that I can report here include FE1, very familiar to you, sweat chloride, um, the CFQR respiratory domain, weight and height scores, um, um, and I'm not going to focus all that much on that because that will be more the focus of some of the GI studies. Um, so um, what we're looking at is the change from baseline to the follow-up visits, uh, and they, those were analyzed in a mixed model with a random intercept for each participant, and I'm sure you all understand the statistics of that. So. Uh, um, and uh, so, so this is basically how this was done, and I'm just going to um, now continue to show you some of the baseline characteristics of that cohort. So the mean age was about nine years, so for this age group of six to 11, and you can see that it, it breaks down into to these different age groups of five to nine and nine to 12, relatively evenly, but a little bit of a higher percentage for the older group. Um, about, um, uh, the, the, you, you see the percentage of females. The majority of these patients, okay? Okay, so I'm going to get closer to the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, um, sorry for that, but thanks, thanks for reminding me. Um, so, um, so, the majority of the patients were white, and, and that's a bit of an issue for many of the CF studies that we have not a representation for all, uh, all different races. Um, and, um, and the breakdown is given in more detail um, in the slide, but uh, the, the more important part is the, the second slide for the baseline characteristics. So you can see about 50% of the patients were homozygous for 5, five or 8, um, and um, if we look at, at previous treatment with, base, uh, with CFTR modulators, then there's actually only 40% were not on CFTR modulators before they, um, they entered the, the PROMIS study and before they were treated with ETI. And that breaks down into Ivercaftor, Loom Iver, and Tess Iver, as you see on that slide. Um, and you can see the baseline height score and weight score were pretty good, but what I really wanted to highlight is the BMI score, which is actually not negative. Um, the baseline LCI, which was 7.25, which is just above the normal range, and um, the baseline FE1, which was smack on 100%. So a relatively healthy cohort. And that's important if we look at the, at the treatment effect that you see over time. So how about the feasibility for all these endpoints? That's also important if you think about these endpoints moving into being clinical measures that we use in the, in the, in the future in our clinics. So for MBW, it was about 75% throughout uh, sweat chloride. Um, for the six months data, there might still be some, some additional data uh, coming in, but it was about 80%. And spirometry was high as expected, as, as was for weight and height, and for CFQR. Um, and what you see with sputum at the, in the lower uh, range is, is what, we, what we see in pediatric patients overall. You can see even at the start, only 42% of these patients were able to produce a sputum sample. 
and that went down to 22% at three months. And we will follow this up over a longer period of time, but uh, the reality is many of these patients dry out and uh, getting uh, sputum is, is becoming more and more problematic. So we mostly have to, uh, have to rely on these OP uh, swaps and some of the data that I will show you related to microbiological outcomes are related to that. So these are the, the, the key endpoints in terms of, um, of the measures that we looked at. On the left-hand side, the lung clearance index, 2.5. And in the middle, the sweat chloride and CFQR, a respiratory domain on the right-hand side. And you, as I mentioned before, of, of, as a mean group, um, the LCI for, the, for, for this patient population was just above the upper limit of normal, which I listed here, which is 7.1 for the new, newer version of the Echomedic software. But you can see there was quite a, quite a range, and some people had, had quite significantly elevated LCI and came down into, into the normal range. But also not everybody uh, of, of these children made it into their normal range. So, but the majority actually did, so, which is uh, reassuring in terms of the treatment effects. And in the red line, you can see uh, the mean effects for the group overall. Sweat chloride, similar to what we've seen in the um, interventional um, clinical trials, uh, came down from about 90 to, um, uh, to a, a range in the 40s. And CFQR, you can see there's quite a bit of noise in this measure, and that's what we've seen in, in a lot of, um, lo lot of studies. So on an individual basis, it is quite, uh, quite noisy. But as a group overall, it, uh, it, it was below 90 and then went up to 90. But the deltas are not quite as big as what we've seen um, in the interventional um, uh, randomized uh, trials. Um, and I can show you that in, in, um, in, in a bit more detail in this table. These are the six-month treatment effects. Basically, everything is significant except for the heights, height change. Um, <coughs> You can see for the LCI, it, it went from 7.25 to 6.5, and the change was a treatment effect for, of 0.7, which is substantially lower to, than what has been seen in some of the interventional studies, but there are two things to consider. One is the, the, the difference in the baseline, and the other is uh, that this was done with the updated version of the software, which corrected for, uh, for an oxygen sensor uh, um, problem that was there before. For sweat chloride, you can see that the change was about uh, four, uh, 47. But again, many of these patients are starting off being on the modulator. Um, you also see the change in, in um, percent FE1 starting off with 100%. Um, after six months, it was 106%. And it's actually a bit confusing if you look at some of the FE1 pa data from our patients where will be the upper limit of what we can achieve with treatment because it's, it's going above 100%. Um, and uh, some increases in weights at Z score and also improvements in CFQR, which at, in the range of four points, which again is, is smaller than what we've seen in the, in the interventional studies before. So overall, uh, consistent treatment effects for all of the, of the measures that we expected to change, um, but at a somewhat lower level, largely due likely to a, uh, to a better baseline for these patients. So this was uh, shown earlier today by Marty Solomon on one of the slides, and these are the changes in the bacterial pathogens. And I'm going to take a little time to, uh, to walk you through this. So, so, uh, so you, see then, um, in, um, you see the percentage of negative uh, cultures, and just let's, let's just focus on Pseudomonas uh, for the first part of that. And you can see the majority of patients, 95% were pseudomonas um, negative at baseline, which is not surprising because of the success of pseudomonas eradication therapy. And the majority of these younger patients now are not chronically infected with pseudomonas. And it didn't really change all that much, but if you start from a baseline of 95%, you cannot expect that there was lots of change. Mm -hmm. But uh, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the left-hand side, and that's stuff aureus, uh, and uh, we know that Staph aureus is quite prevalent in, in younger patients with cystic fibrosis. Here you can see that about 75% of patients had Staph aureus at baseline. Um, and it's, it's broken down into the qualitative culture results be, because that's based on throat swabs and we can't do uh, quantitative cultures on throat swabs. And if you see over time, there's a bit of a shift in terms of the qualitative culture results that the overall 
um, positivity in terms of the amount that staff that was found was lower. But if you look at the overall percentage, even after three months, 72% still have, were staff positive. And that to me was actually a little bit surprising because I was expecting that there was more clearance of staff aureus over time in this cohort of, uh, of patients. And there's something that we need to follow up over longer time periods because um, reduction of, of the amount of, of uh, bacteria is certainly a, a good thing, but in the end what we would like to accomplish is clearance over time. So this brings me to the conclusions as to the data that we have today. So in this ongoing prospective observational post-approval study of ETI, um, in children, there were significant improvements in the, in the main outcomes in LCI, in FE1, in sweat chloride, and in the self-reported uh, respiratory symptoms um, um, six months after drug initiation. Um, the magnitude of change for all outcome measures was lower than that reported in the phase three clinical trial in this age range, uh, but baseline lung function was also better. So, um, so it's always difficult to interpret, is this just reflected by that, or is there a difference in terms of the response overall that we have to expect in real life? And future reports will evaluate a broader range of endpoints, and we, we hope to run this study for at least four years so that we can also, in the end, look at the endpoints that we're most interested in, which is lung function decline over time. Because the earlier we start treatments like that, the hope is the, the, the more we will see an effect on lung function decline over, over time. So, and that will be something um, that we can report for the next couple of years at this meeting. So um, with that, I would like to acknowledge all the pediatric subsites for, um, for the PROMISE study. It really takes a large team to, to run a study like that. And you can see these were 20 sites out of the overall PROMISE sites. And, uh, that participated in the study and did a great job with all these endpoints, including LCI, which is sometimes more, a bit more challenging to do. And so really want to acknowledge the contribution of, of all, all of these groups. Um, so, and, and finally, I also, also want to acknowledge uh, the, all the participants, all the patients that participated in the study, as well as the TDN centers and their staff and, uh, and the CF Foundation for funding the study. So, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And if you want to run up to uh, ask a question, you can have my microphone. <laughs> Thank you for that talk. It was really wonderful. We have several questions through the app. Okay. So, um, and, and I had a question also uh, to start with. So, what do you think about some of the sweat chloride values going up for patients at six months? Is this a marker of discontinuation or non-adherence, and should we be using that clinically for monitoring? That's a very good question, and we can't really um, be absolutely sure about it, but that's my bias as well. I mean, it's a, that's what you see in patients that are not adherent, that the sweat chloride is, is going up, and as a monitoring tool, that's probably, probably what's it, what it's most useful for, um, and uh, because... Uh, the absolute change in, in chloride otherwise will not help us in terms of the other clinical endpoints. But uh, yes, I would, I would think that that's the case. Well, as a, as a follow-up, one of the questions was, um, is there any correlation before, between the poor LCI reduction and poor sweat chloride reduction? We don't see a strong correlation between that. And, and, um, and that's, that's kind of consistent that the outcomes between clinical measures and, um, and sweat chloride outcomes are not very strong. On, uh, if, you, if you plot individual patients. If you do it for studies mm -hmm. overall, you see that trend that if you have a more effective CFTR modulators, you see more response in, in sweat chloride and you see more response in, in outcomes such as LCI or FE1. Uh, but overall, that's... Uh, and and uh, Morty Solomon showed this correlation between changes in, uh, in, in sweat chloride and FE1 uh, this morning, but you need a you need a huge cohort to see a, even a weak correlation, at, and that tells you that the overall correlation is not very strong. There were also several questions about nutrition and and the GI effects. One was if you measured fecal fats on any of the individuals. Yeah, f no one wants to do <laughs> fecal fat measurements anyway <laughs> anymore. So, uh, fecal elastase was certainly one of the endpoints that is being looked at, and. Uh, I have to refer you to the GI sub-study, which will also be presented, and, and I'm, 
Um, I, I can't give you the data at the present time. So I, um, the, the, it, what, what seems to be the case so far is that uh, improvements in fecal elastase is relatively limited in this age group of six and above, which was maybe a little bit different from what we see in the, in the gating mutation studies, um, um, telling us probably that 508 and the minimal function mutations are somewhat more severe than G551D. Um, but it will be very interesting to follow this in the younger age group. So, so in the, uh, if, as we move these drugs to, um, to the preschool age group and also then to infancy, then, then it's really going to be interesting how, how many patients can we turn from, um, from PI to, to PS or at least improve their, their fecal elastase. So, um, so the, this, this will be an ongoing story, but so far the, the data that, that are there for fecal elastase are not super convincing that there's a major effect in this age group. And as a bit of a correlate to that, uh, we had someone ask if the weight gain was greater than what, what was expected for growing children at that time, in that time frame or not. Yeah, that's always a, a good question because if you, if you see many of these study results and you, sh you look at weight gain over time and you have an expected weight gain, then really you should look at the Z scores for that, and there's an improvement in the Z score. Um, but um, so, so that's really the, the more relevant um, parameter to, to base this on. Um, and um, yeah, for the weight gain, it's also a, a difficult question because weight gain isn't necessarily a good thing if you start off with a normal weight, which was the case for this cohort. So um, we used to think that, yes, weight gain is always great in CF, but uh, for the population, that might not be the case, and especially if we don't show that what, we, what is gained is really muscle, more lean muscle, uh, body mass, and not um, just fat, which um, is certainly not of any advantage for patients and may actually cause them trouble later on. Uh there are a couple of questions about the about staff, uh, the staff aureus and the microcultures in general, and so I'm going to pull them. Uh, did the staff results include both MSSA and MRSA, and uh, could it be that the sputum cultures were of poorer quality on ETI, and that may perhaps be masking what would have been a larger difference in staph airway infection in the lower respiratory tract? Yeah, for, for now, this, uh, this includes both MSSA and MRSA. The majority is MSSA, but, and we we're going to uh, sort this out in more detail as, as we move the study along. Um, and what was the second question again? Mm, or the quality, <laughs> quality of the samples. Oh, the quality of the samples. So this, the data that I showed you is just on throat swaps because the, the sputum, um, the amount of patients that were actually capable of, of producing sputum was rather low. So, and that is, that is a quality issue. I still, I, I'm still a bit surprised that we find um, staff in such a high percentage. So we, uh, in the population, you would expect about a third of the population having um, staff in their upper airway. So you could argue that there's certainly some contamination of the upper airway, and there will be. But at the end of the three months, there was still 75% of the patients that had staff in their upper airway. So, so you cannot just blame that for, 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 for the prevalence of, of staff. So, so I think that will be very interesting for us to, to uh, look at over time. Um, and there's ongoing work to look at, uh, at the typing of the staff in terms of whether it's going to be the same staff that you maintain over time or whether it changes back and forth. And all of that will help us to better understand those data. Uh, thank you. One, one last uh, important question is, do you think that site selection drove the demographics of the sample? Um, so, so because we only uh, selected the best sites in the country? Or? Based on, well, based, based on the cities in which the sites are located, perhaps there well, are it, it could well be, but the, the reality is, uh, is what is represented here in terms of baseline characters is quite characteristic of what, what is seen in the in the CF uh, centers overall. I mean, that's just a, I mean, and it just shows how, how much progress is, has been made over the years in terms of, of treating patients and even before we had drugs like ETI, so. Yeah. Oh, did, did uh, Promise translate the materials, the study materials into Spanish? Do you know? That's a bigger question. Ooh, I, I don't know. So I'd, I'd actually, I, I have to get back to you for that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, thanks. There were a lot of other questions. <clears throat> so feel free to come up and bother Felix later. 
I have the pleasure of introducing <coughs> our next speaker, Dr. Corey Danes, a professor and division chief at the University of Arizona. She's also the CF Center Director, and she will be giving us an update on the long-term safety and efficacy of ETI in people with CF and at least one F508 Dell allele, the 144-week extension study. So thank you, and I apologize if my voice is a little rough today. I am sure that uh, some of the children gave me RSV last week. Um, it's not COVID, I promise. Um, so this is a very exciting talk for me to be able to give because I get to tell you the clinical trial results, the interim analysis for the 144-week roll-on study for the ETI in 12 and above. So this was, of course, started with the pivotal trials that got Trikafta approved for the and what we're doing now is the rollover study and it's the 144 week interim analysis. I would expect that the vast majority of you in this audience have participated in this trial in some way and so um, thank you for being a part of it because I think that um, we have some really interesting and exciting results to build from from here. So I have nothing to disclose other than the fact that I was an investigator on this study. Um, so as most of you know, um, ETI was shown to be safe and effective in the two pivotal trials uh, uh, that, that gave the approval for this drug with the FDA. The 102 trial was for individuals who had one Delta F508 and a minimally functional second mutation. So that's what FMF means, and we'll refer to it from there. And it was a 24-week placebo-controlled trial. The second study was a uh, 103 was for uh, people who were homozygous of the Delta F508, and it was a four-week active controlled trial. So these individuals had a four-week run-in on Tez IVA, and then the active control for that four-week trial was Tez IVA versus, uh, versus ETI and it was only a four-week trial. Every individual who, who wanted to be rolled over uh, from those two pivotal trials was able to enroll into the 445105 study. Um, it is a 192-week open-label extension study, so we still have another year to go. And uh, we are assessing, of course, primarily the long-term safety of ETI in participants who completed that pivotal trial. We have already uh, published the 24-week data and the 96-week data as, int as, as interim analyses, and now we get to look at the 144-week analysis. Oops, sorry. So our primary objective was data, was uh, safety here. And so we are really wanting to make sure that ETI on a long-term basis is safe in individuals with CF who have at least one copy of the Delta F508. Our secondary outcomes, which we'll talk about today, are to evaluate the long-term efficacy and the pharmacodynamics of ETI. So here's the study design, which I just uh, talked about. We had the two parent studies, one that was 24 weeks placebo controlled. The second was a four week active controlled trial for the, for the homozygous individuals that rolled into the uh, open label extension. So in the ETI study, um, it's going to be 192 weeks and then there will be a four week follow up study. Again, our primary endpoints were safety and our secondary endpoints you're going to see as well are changes in lung function and changes in sweat chloride, changes in CFQR, respiratory domain scores, BMI, and the number of pulmonary exacerbations. And then we did an ad hoc analysis at the end of this to look at the rate of change uh, in, in lung function. So um, at the time, the data cutoff was at 144 weeks, and what that means is that every single individual in the trial that was continuing in the trial had reached 144 weeks. And so it was all the data that was collected up to that point, which means it's long, we have more data than 144 weeks. Um, but that was the cutoff point, so every single individual had at least gotten to that point. For safety analyses, all of the data is pooled for, the, um, for both of the pivotal trials. So both if you had one copy of the Delta F or two copies of the Delta F, because the safety was our primary endpoint and all of the data is pooled. For the secondary uh, outcomes, the data is separate because we have an actual placebo control baseline 
from which to control for the 102 study, and we did not have that for the 103 study. And so those, those, um, those efficacy data uh, will be separate when we go through the results that we have uh, so far. And I am not going to try to explain statistics to you, so you can take a picture. Um, so here is the way the patient population, the subject population, was distributed. Um, you can see that we had approximately 400 individuals in the 102 trial that rolled into the rollover study, and then we had approximately, there were 107 individuals in the, in the homozygous 103 trial that rolled over. And you can see that out of that 507 individuals that were participants in the 102 and 103, that 506 of them enrolled in the rollover trial. So we did get basically the entire population to go into the rollover trial. As of the, um, the data cut, you can see what has happened with those individuals. We have 73 participants out of 506 so far who have prematurely discontinued the trial, and there are the reasons for, them pre for, for their premature discontinuation. It was adverse events in a, few, in, in a few cases, and we will go through those adverse events. There were, there were eight pregnancies in the trial that, asked, that had them uh, leave the trial. Um, many people just wanted to change to commercial drug. We had people who just wanted to not be in a clinical trial anymore and had their own reasons for discontinuing. So now, moving from 144, there were 433 participants that finished 144 weeks and are ongoing. These were our baseline demographics as they rolled into the open label trial. And um, they are typical, as you can see, of the, of the population that are 12 and up uh, and have cystic fibrosis in the United States um, and across Europe. We had 93.5% um, that, were, that were white and 1.2% that were black or African American with about with um, not having collected specifically here uh, uh, some data because of regulatory uh, requirements. Um, when we have Hispanic data, it's, it was 4.2% that we knew. Um, so th that was, those were our baseline demographics. And here were our baseline uh, statistics for individuals. And the baseline FEV1 is what was measured at the baseline of their entrance into the pivotal trial, not at their entrance into the rollover trial. So at baseline, at 102 and 103, the, the individuals had an average FEV1 of 61.2%. You can see the average exposure duration was actually 151 weeks because as I said, most of the individuals were long past 144, and all of that data is included in the primary endpoint of safety. And this just breaks down how many people were in each age group, in each group of how many weeks they stayed in the study. The, the smaller numbers for the smaller weeks are the ones that have dropped out. So here go our safety results. Um, on the very far Right panel, um, you're going to see the placebo arm for the 102 trial. You'll notice we do not have the 103 trial here because there was no placebo control. It was an active control. So you can, you can um, understand that there are individuals in the, in the 445 that are not included in the placebo and active arm in the 102 trial. So we have an, a larger N here. So in terms of all of the adverse events, you can see that there was a significant just decrease in, from the 1287 or 1288 in the placebo arm after six months versus about 1100 in the, in the individuals in the, in the active, in the placebo control trial at the end of six months. When all, as all of those individuals have rolled over into the 444, 445 trial, you can see these events are significantly lower. Total caveats here, okay, guys? I mean, I am not going to sit here and tell you that if you stay on this drug longer, you're going to have fewer side effects. That is not, that is not the, the end point. Um, but you can see that at least in terms of total adverse events, that the events per 100 patient years was about half in the rollover study as it was in the active control, in the, in the placebo controlled trial. 
This happened during COVID, if any of you guys hadn't figured that out yet. Um, and so you have to take everything on AEs with a grain of salt. All of, our, all of our subjects were just as isolated as your patients were in your clinics. And so you would have to suggest that there are confounding factors that may have influenced how many adverse events we had. That said, it doesn't look like we have more adverse events if you, if you, if you normalize it for 100 patient years in the rollover study than we had in the placebo-controlled study. And the vast majority of our adverse events were mild or moderate. We did have some severe, but mild or moderate for the most part. These are the adverse events that fit on the table. <laughs> um, there will be more in the paper when it's published. Um, because on the supplemental information, there's actually three tables. Um, everybody had an adverse event. You can imagine, this is a, we're looking at over three-year data for individuals in this trial. Um, but, what you, but again, that top line is the, all the AEs. These were the most common, so you've got the top here. And I'm just waiting for the question about mental health. So I will tell you what's on table two or table three. Um, what we have defined is depression. And if you look at depression, the percentage of participants that described depression was 7.1%. If, if, you, if you normalize that for events per 100 patient years, it's about 2.7 per 100 patient years, just, just as a reference. Anxiety was 6.3%. And if you, round, if you normalize that, it works out at about 2.6 per pa 100 patient years. Um, insomnia was right around 6% as well. Those were the three mental health captured AEs that were found in the trial. Um, if you want to compare that backwards to the placebo control, I, I'm, I can try. <laughs> so what I tell you is that depression there in the, in, the, um, in the active arm, there were three individuals who described depression versus one in the placebo arm in the six-month trial. In anxiety, there were, again, three to one um, in the active trial versus the placebo trial. None of that is statistically significant because it was a six-month trial and it's very low end numbers. Um, but that's where we are with the mental health, and that's what we have captured so far in the open label, uh, in the open label study. Okay. We had two, running into this trial, we had two really um, important adverse events that were, being, that were being tracked, and those were uh, the transaminases and the, and the, and the rashes. And here's, here is the data on elevation of, of AST and ALT. And you can see that we had a fair number of individuals who ended up having some elevation of their, of their AST or their ALT. We had a total of 82 participants, 16.2% have an AE related to this. 21 individuals interrupted study drug due to an adverse event of elevated L LFTs, and six permanently discontinued the trial. So out of your AE group that discontinued, um, it's, the number is six. If you want to look at the two individuals here that had also new, newly occurring bilirubin above two, um, one of those individuals had Gilbert's syndrome. Um, yeah. <laughs> And the other individual did discontinue the trial when their bilirubin elevated, and, um, and in the follow-up, their bilirubin returned to normal, as did their liver function tests after they discontinued the trial. The rash uh, events, it's just numerical there in terms of the numbers. Numerically higher numbers of women did have rash uh, than men. Um, and you can, and in terms of, uh, dis, of, of interruptions, you can see how many people interrupted or discontinued due to rash. Okay, secondary effects. It's the secondary effects. This is the data on FEV1 for individuals that had 
FMF, so one copy of the delta F and a minimally functionally second mutation. And what we see in the, in the, in the clinical trial done during COVID is that there's no diminution of effect on your FEV1 at 144 weeks, none at all. And that's pretty remarkable. And that's what Dr. Polonini set me up for. Mm -hmm. um, so um, at 144 weeks, our improvement from baseline at, of our FEV1 was average 14.1%. In the pivotal trial, at the end of six months, it was 13.9%. So just to give you some, some, and that was, and then, if you comp, and then if you add in the individuals that went from placebo, their improvement was 14.8%. So we have some very significant uh, results that do not, do not decrease. This is the reduction in sweat chlorides. Once again, there is no diminution of effect at 144 weeks. So in the parent study, the, the decrease in sweat was minus 42.2 points. In the open label, it was either minus 50.5 or minus 47.2. So if anything, more of an effect at the end of 144 weeks compared to baseline, compared to placebo. This is their CFQR. So these are their respiratory domains on their, on their, on their, rest, on their scoring. And once again, the, the changes, while there is more wiggle in this line, it is, uh, it is pretty consistent. The improvement in their respiratory domain scores was 17.5 at the end of the pivotal trial, and uh, after 144 weeks was either 17.6 or 19.1 for the two different trials. This is BMI. So at the end of six weeks, we had um, an increase in BMI of 1.13, and now at 144 weeks, it's 1.76 or 1.61 in terms of the increase in BMI. So, um, over, and then the overall thing, and this was also shown in the, in the plenary today, um, the annualized mean pulmonary exacerbation rate was 0 0.2, which is pretty remarkably significant over, over 144 weeks. So um, that, was, that, was, that was an important result. Um, and, the, and in the same ad hoc analysis, the annualized mean rate of change in FEVV1 was positive 0 0.08 over the 144 weeks. Okay, now you get to see the FF results. So for the Delta, uh, the, the homozygous individuals, this is your FEV1. Again, it was maintained um, at the end of four weeks, which was again an active control trial, was 10.4% 10 10 increase. Um, and in, at 144 weeks, those numbers are 12 and 11.6 at the end of 144 weeks. Smaller in, um, but, uh, but uh, same result. Sweat chlorides, down minus 43.4% at the end of the four weeks. Um, down minus 53.4 or minus 49.9 at 144 weeks. CFQR, improvement of 16 points at the end of four weeks. It was 13.9 or 18.2 in the other two ranges. There is, again, more wiggle in this line. It's a smaller N. And here are the BMI results. So we were up 0.53 after four weeks, 1.5 or 1.74 at the end of 144 weeks. And the same ad hoc analyses, the pulmonary exacerbation rate annualized was 0.18 in this group. And their, and their longitudinal mean rate of change in the, in the, in the FEV1 was a positive 0 0.03. So it feels like a mic drop. <laughs> um, it's pretty cool, um, and you know. But my limitations are real, and I hope you challenge me with the questions afterwards. Um, this overlapped with COVID, absolutely. That absolutely plays a role, not only in how many adverse events we had, but in this maintenance of lung function. They didn't get sick. They didn't have significant numbers of, of pulmonary exacerbations. Nothing that we're used to as clinicians. And so that is an important thing to think about. 
The study was very facile at, at, at movement during this time. We did a lot of remote visits. And, we, and so we sent out study drug, we collected questionnaires, we collected AEs, we had nurses go into homes to do assessments and to draw blood during this time. Um, we, we would, we would when, we, when each individual institution was able to bring people back into their institutions to do lung function tests, to do sweat chlorides, they did those as they were able to do them. Um, with all of the, all of the conditions having, having been met. So we pivoted significantly during this trial to make sure that we could keep the individuals safe and that we could keep them on study drug during, during the trial. And of course, we do believe that the COVID is probably an, a, a, you know, a, a, a factor in what results we have, but they're, but they're pretty significant results. So in the end, there was no new safety signal after 144 weeks on the rollover trial on, in adverse events. It, they were at best um, the same or lower as they were in the pivotal trials. We did not see emergence of new adverse events. Um, there were clinically meaningful improvements in lung function, respiratory symptoms, CFTR function with sweat chlorides and nutritional status that were maintained at 144 weeks. And those annual, annualized rates of change were significant in terms of our reduction of pulmonary exacerbations and what we did to lung function. So this was a wonderful study and continues to be a wonderful study that we have been involved in. I just personally would like to thank all of the sites, and most of you are in this room, who have been a part of this and, and all of the participants, our subjects who stuck with us through thick and thin and have continued in this study to give us this information because it's so important for us as clinicians to know what are the long-term effects of these, of these drugs and how is it going to take us into the future. So with that, I'll be done. Thank you for that wonderful talk. We have a lot of questions. <laughs> I knew you would. Uh, so, I am going to say that um, you were a psychic about the mental health question mm -hmm. because right uh, before you said that, we got one, and she wasn't looking at the app, I promise. I promise. I wasn't. Mm -hmm. She just knew. Uh, and so, there was a follow-on question because you did address that, but um, could the mental health in the general population just have been reflected in some of the patients who had a, a dip in quality of life, and how would you address that aspect. I think it's, it's absolutely possible that that, I mean, we all know mental health suffered for all of us during the COVID pandemic. And that is obviously going to influence what mental health um, issues our subjects are, are having during the participation of the trial and probably going to influence their, their scores. Now remember that those questionnaires were the respiratory domain, which stayed high during the pandemic. Let's look at the rest of the CFQR and see what other things happened there. That was, uh, you know, that was what we collected. I'm sorry, Kristen, that we didn't do better in terms of the collection items that we used for mental health, because we, you know, in retrospect, that would have been great. Um, and which is why I am so excited about Promise and Heroes and, and the efforts coming out of the UK, because um, that's really gonna give us a lot more information about, about these things in the real world and whether or not it's effective. The other thing I'll say is just stay tuned for another year. Mm -hmm. Let's see what, 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 what results I bring to the table in a year, because we'll be out of the pandemic for that last year, and I will, I'm very interested to see what happens. So I have two or three more types of questions. Um, one about pulmonary exacerbations. And so um, thinking about what did it include both outpatient and inpatient pulmonary exacerbations only, or only those requiring um, IV antibiotics? And then a subsequent follow-on, uh, was there any measurement or, or what did you see in the recovery of FEV1 uh, after the treatment of the pulmonary exacerbations? How well is that, is that documented? It's going to be hard to tease that out. Um, you'd have to look at individual person data to be able to tell whether or not there was um, recovery and the timing of that because, you know, when they had a pulmonary exacerbation versus when they had a lung function 
tests done per the protocol probably don't line up. So that's going to be much more of a clinical answer than I can give. In terms of the pulmonary exacerbations, it was a pulmonary exacerbation as deemed by the investigator on the site. So it could be anything. It could be oral antibiotics. Could be an increase in lung function, an increase in airway clearance. Um, could be IV antibiotics. Could be hospitalization. It was all comers. It was if you, as an investigator, said it was a pulmonary exacerbation. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then about compliance and adherence, um, did you measure uh, participant adherence um, to the study drug and also to airway clearance therapy throughout the open label study? Um, and then there was a question about uh, any correlation between. Uh, adherence or non-adherence and the, and the poor responders. What do you know about the poor responders? We're going to have to tease that out. I hope that's another ad hoc analysis that they do or help us to do because I think that's really important. Um, this is a clinical trial, a controlled clinical trial, which meant that the party line was you stay on all of your therapies, mm -hmm. right? And so when an individual would come in for a study visit, you would ask them, are you on all your therapies? Are you, have you changed anything? And you got the answer that you got, okay? Um, and, and, and so in terms of adherence to other CF therapies, um, I think that had, if this were a real world study, if this was promised, we would have much better information about what people did. Um, in terms of adherence to study drug, we asked them to return their cards and so that we could see that they had taken their study drug. Could they have popped them out and dropped them in the toilet? Sure. Um, but we had them return their cards, and we did measure, um, we did measure whether or not they were um, uh, adherent to the study drug. I don't have that data I, I, yet, and I probably won't until the study wraps up so we can really see what the overall um, sticking to their, their study regimen was. Um, but that was measured at every, at every visit. Excellent. Uh, thank you. And I'm just going to ask uh, one more question. There are so many great questions, so I want you to... I did, I did invite it, so thank you. <laughs> I want you to come, come up at the end and, and speak. But um, I wanted to ask, the, did Vertex reveal anything about the concentrations of ETI? Or were there measurements of concentrations of ETI during uh, the open label extension? We saved serum and okay. sent it to them. So no, nothing that was revealed. Okay. The answer is, and it was not part of any specific lab uh, draw that we were done, that was done. Everything was done for safety. Okay. Um, there, there, is, there is frozen, there are frozen samples that potentially they could do that with, but I do not know what Vertex's plans are or what they intend, and I'm looking around the room to see if anybody does. Okay. Okay. Well, wonderful. Well, Thank okay. you. Thanks so All right, much. Thanks. All right. And I'd like to introduce. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Jill Maggs. She uh, has a long history of experience in qualitative research in cystic fibrosis, and she's also a CF community member uh, who, with an adult child with cystic fibrosis. So she will be speaking about the qualitative examination of participation in the Simplify Treatment Withdrawal Trial. Okay. All right. So um, I have nothing to declare. Okay. <laughs> right. You can tell I'm not used to this. Um, this presentation is about a study that is about a study. We set out on a quest to seek a qualitative understanding of the experience of the Simplify trial. Um, I like wordplay, but I'm, I really enjoy the, um, the, the, the acronym that we came up with for, for this study. This is the first of a anticipated series of papers and presentations. We collected so much data um, about people with CF's perceptions of being in a withdrawal study and the broader context of medication withdrawal 
on life with CF. We, I personally would like to um, commend the CF Foundation for supporting qualitative research that allows the real life experiences of, of being in a withdrawal study, the attitudes and values of people with CF to be acknowledged and acted upon. Um, and to ensure that a diverse range of voices is heard. Looking at the experience of being in Simplify holds a, a special interest because it, as we've been hearing, is one of the first withdrawal studies in the CF population. It might be assumed that people with CF will be excited at the thought of stopping a medication. We know that many do by themselves, but not everybody. Um, uh, but we don't really know if that's, that's true. If you've been told all your life how important it is to be adherent with airway clearance, medications, etc., etc., what does it feel like to be told that you can ease up? Are people with CF willing to take part in withdrawal studies? Qualitative methods offer a rigorous, trustworthy way to understand the experience of this withdrawal study, or for that matter, any other clinical trial, and the potential impact of the product or the phenomenon under investigation. As a qualitative researcher, you're supposed to acknowledge your biases. So I, I'm biased. I believe that hearing real voices enriches our understanding of the impact of clinical science and what it, the impact it has on well-being, daily life, attitudes and values. This is um, the objective that's the focus of today's uh, presentation. Um, there will be others down the road. We were successful in recruiting and interviewing 91 people with CF who'd completed Simplify and 23 caregivers. These interviews, as I said, have given us a lot of data um, from a lot of people. Um, this was a huge qualitative study. The People with CF who were enrolled in Quest came from 39 sites, and this was possible um, because fortuitously um, there was a decision to conduct the interviews by telephone or um, Zoom audio. I say fortuitously because, of course, most of this data was collected during um, COVID. We purposefully recruited participants to represent each of the study arms of Simplify and showed a particular interest in getting hold of teenagers and people with lower PFTs to take part. Teenagers are often regarded as a challenge to interview and although we had some who were monosyllabic, um, cred credit to our interviewers. Um, they actually got some very thoughtful and reflective responses um, from the teenagers, as, as well as the adults. But some, some of the things that the teenagers told us were, were, gave pause for thought. We sought the um, experiences of people with lower PFTs because perhaps if you're not so well, you, you might be a little bit more feel more dependent on your therapies, and so be reluctant to take part in withdrawal studies. So it seemed important to um, hear what they had to say. Reading and analysing the interview transcripts was very time consuming. The transcripts were read very carefully for meaning. This wasn't and I think there are probably some people here will attest to this, a word search exercise. Um, our coders are, are in the audience. Um, as I said, we, we collected far more data than is usual for a qualitative study. But we wanted to make sure that all of the groups we were interested in reach saturation, 
which means in qualitative terms that no new themes were coming up um, when we read the uh, transcripts. And some very clear themes did emerge. Um, for the CF um, community, there were community reasons why people joined. Um, lots of people had personal reasons for joining. And some people joined because their CF care team suggested it and told them about the study. So clinicians can in, um, influence patient behavior. For the CF community, these, there was a real sense of altruism that people with CF feel that we're in this together. And this was um, very clearly expressed by, by the participants. I hope at the back you can actually read the, the quotes. You can see what people were telling us. Um, many felt that because they were healthy, the potential risk to their health of taking part in a withdrawal study was acceptable because it might benefit someone in the community who was less healthy um, and also children. Some participants were clearly interested in the science that supports their care um, and, and linked the science to Im improvements. And they felt it was important to contribute to the research um, and scientific developments if they could. Um, some of the, the people also expressed an interest in, in finding a cure, which wasn't really what Simplify was about, but I, I think it shows their commitment to, to being part of the scientific um, endeavors to improve their lives. Some people in general tend to be curious about their health um, and People, some of the participants, expressed an interest in discovering what the effects on their health might be of withdrawing either Dornay's or hypertonic. As well as the impact on their health, participants wondered what the impact might be um, on, on their lifestyle. Again, if you've been told to do this every day and how important it is, and it becomes a habit. It's a bit like going out without brushing your teeth in the morning. Um, and we can all imagine what, what that feels like. Not doing these therapies doesn't give you a great deal of time back, um, but some people um, expressed an, an interest in experiencing what they termed a more normal life. Um, some people were wary of stopping by themselves, and they, they wanted a safety net. Um, that if they stopped a medication, um, that they were going to be monitored. Um, and, of course, the study provided that. Some people liked to be paid for being in the study. <laughs> Money talks. The number of people living with CF is relatively small, and there's a great deal of research, as events like this show. Um, so many people in this study um, had prior experience of being um, research participants. And this can be helpful. Um, compared to some studies, Simplify was an easy one. Um, no specimen collection, that was a good one. No blood <laughs> draws um, and not too many extra visits. Another reason linked perhaps to altruism is that participants are were conscious of the support that they receive from carers and some expressed a desire to see if they could reduce this dependency. Um, one of the parents um, expressed um, the desire that being in this study um, might, might help um, her child become more independent. Randomization um, is a key factor in many clinical trials. And as I mentioned, a prior positive experience in a, a research study contributed to um, some people joining Simplify. 
this exposure um, may explain the general understanding of clinical trials that the participants showed. And certainly the research coordinators are obviously doing a, a good job of explaining um, what, what it means to be in a, a clinical trial and, and the, what randomization is. But even if people weren't randomized to their preferred study arm, they expressed an understanding of, of the need to stay the course. Of course, some people join Simplify with the expressed hope that they'd be able to stop either their Dornays or their hypertonic saline. And they were disappointed to be assigned to the maintained group. They had some different ways of expressing this, but some were quite forceful. Um, and, but one thing's very clear, especially if you listen to the tapes, that it was expressed with good humor and acceptance. <laughs> some people were actually very relieved to be in the maintain group. They felt they were doing well. They were pleased to stay as they were. They felt they were contributing. Um, to, to the clinical science, um, and they were happy to carry on as, as usual. Others were indifferent. Um, it was just business as usual for them. They didn't mind either way. So people in the discontinuum felt safe stopping um, as part of the study. They were pleased that their reaction to stopping a medication was being monitored and felt that if there were any problems or deterioration, they had someone to reach out to um, and they could restart the medication. They were happy to have a little bit of time in their day, um, although several acknowledged that it, it wasn't that much, much, but it did mean perhaps a little longer in bed, going to bed a little earlier, a little, mornings were perhaps a little less rushed. Um, in the discontinue group, there were some people who were both apprehensive about stopping and excited, as well as the, the concerns about respiratory symptoms worsening. Um, some participants expressed apprehension about the impact on their routines. If you've kind of built a wall of adherence over many years, and, and some of these um, participants had been taking the, using these medications for a long time, if you take one of those bricks out of the wall, are things going to crack? Um, is the whole edifice going to come tumbling down? So um, one of the participants told us that they um, put a reminder on their fridge door so that they didn't mindlessly reach for their, for their dornays, um, so because that was such an ingrained routine for them. So, conclusions from what we were told. Participants in Quest um, talked about the experience of, of Simplify, giving, being in a withdrawal trial, giving them hope for a more normal future with fewer medications. And this is, of course, very closely integrated with, with they, the, the, the fact that they were taking um, an ETI. Many appreciated the opportunity to contribute to this potentially better future by taking part in future withdrawal studies. They showed their understanding being based um, being evidence-based, and the need for sound science to inform their management. Appealing to the altruism of people with CF and providing clear rationales for clinical trials, along with reassurance for regarding safety measures, are factors to consider when developing recruitment strategies for future withdrawal studies. This, like, like nearly all studies, was very much a team effort. Um, the names here are the people who've been especially involved with data collection analysis to date uh, and in helping 
prepare this um, presentation. So thank you to them, and thank you to all the people who took part in the study. Thank you for that wonderful presentation uh, and the important data collection. I think it's really informative about mm -hmm. why patients, why uh, people living with CF are, are willing to participate in clinical research, not just a withdrawal study, uh, mm -hmm. absolutely. Um, I, had, I had two questions. Um, one is, did you evaluate the coping strategies, either over control or avoidance uh, patterns for the individuals to see whether that's associated with their positive or negative feelings about their randomization arm? The simple answer to that is no, we didn't. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No. okay. Um, sorry, I asked you a yes-no question. <laughs> Um, yes, <laughs> not a good qualitative strategy. <laughs> that was not. Uh, okay, well then I'll, I'll go with another another question that maybe yes, no. But um, do you happen to know the race and ethnicity pattern of the um, participants in in your study? Uh, is, was it just representative of Simplify, or was there any oversampling of? Um, Underrepresented groups. Um, I think that's data that we will be pulling. You're waiting um, on. Okay. But I, no, I can't. Another <laughs> yes, no question. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, so I don't, I don't have any other questions here. Um, Does anyone in the audience have any questions? If not, thank you very much. Jill. Thank you. this ready. So our last um, speaker today is Dr. Larry Lance, not Dr. Constant, who just says up there. Um, it's Dr. Larry Lance, who is the Director of Pediatric Respiratory Medicine and Cystic Fibrosis Clinic in Montreal, Canada, um, at the Montreal Children's Hospital, McGill University Health Center, and he's going to speak to us about another really good, interesting clinical trial. Well, unfortunately, Mike can't be with us today, and so I'm stepping in and pleased to present to you the results of our uh, phase two study of uh, the inflammatory controlling <coughs> drug, LAU7B, uh, in adults with cystic fibrosis. Now, I realize as the last speaker, it's only me standing between you and a beer. So please bear with us, and we'll go through our results. So, and for this presentation, uh, I uh, do work with Laurent Pharmaceuticals on their scientific advisory board. So the rationale behind this study is that despite the uh, modulators, there's still ongoing inflammation. And there's evidence that inflammation can actually interfere with and diminish the effect of modulators on CFTR function. And that LAU7B, which is an oral formulation of phenretinoid, which is a retinoic acid derivative, uh, alters lipids, especially lipids in the cell membrane, such that it can maintain CFTR at the cell surface and will also act as a pro-resolving uh, medication for resolving inflammation. So we did a randomized controlled trial. It was a six-month study. There were uh, six four-week uh, uh, cycles, uh, and uh, we, our hypothesis was that it would slow the degradation of uh, lung disease uh, in terms of change in abs uh, of FEV1 percent predicted uh, at day 161, which is the end of uh, 24 weeks, and that it would complement standard of care, including the use of CFTR modulators. Uh, Patients were randomized to either LAU7B or placebo. It was a once-daily uh, formulation uh, taken, as I said, over six cycles. Uh, they maintained their therapies, including if they were already on modulators, uh, that they would stay on their modulators. The primary endpoint was the uh, change in percent predicted FEV1 uh, and safety. 
and we had secondary outcomes, uh, including uh, the relative change in FEV1, uh, data related to exacerbations, uh, and, uh, and quality of life, and also we did inflammation and lipidomic markers. So to be in the study, you have to be 18 years and old or older, uh, FEV1 between 40 and 100% predicted, and you had to have one exacerbation which was defined by the, the by the clinician, but receiving either an IV or oral treatment at least once uh, in the year preceding being in the trial. We did a, a pre-analysis uh, pre uh, stratification based on uh, FEV1, uh, exacerbation frequency, and whether they were on CFTR modulators or not to begin with. Our target sample was 120 patients to complete the PER protocol, uh, and our goal was to uh, detect a 4% change uh, in, in the predicted uh, FEV1. So we uh, evaluated 250 patients to finally uh, arrive at our, our uh, final data set uh, to make sure that we had adequate numbers. Um, and if you look at the left panel, you can see that between our, our active group and the placebo group, it was well balanced in terms of age, BMI, sex, uh, percent predicted, and the number of exacerbations had in the last year. And you can also see in, in the lower panel as well that uh, in terms of our pre-stratification, whether they were above or below 7% of V1, uh, whether they were on CFT modulators, including uh, Troy Kafta, uh, that there was fairly well balanced. And we had a reasonable number of patients uh, that were on Troy Kafta. So we randomized 166 patients. That's our intention to treat population. And then we had a per protocol population, which were, were defined as those who had completed at least five of the six cycles. And uh, we did have some dropouts. Most of the reasons for people dropping out were related to um, COVID restrictions, uh, they had personal reasons, or they were starting Trikafta, um, or there were some protocol deviations uh, where the, there weren't many dropouts due to uh, treatment emergent adverse events. So just to orient you, because this is how we'll present our data, uh, the active group is in blue and the placebo group is in red. Uh, on the y-axis, we have the absolute uh, change in percentage points of uh, FEV1. And along the x-axis uh, is days. Those are the study visits going all the way up to 161. And you can see in the intention to treat group. The, the, okay, forget, we won't, we won't get the pointer. Um, that uh, and we, we analyzed the data in two ways. Uh, we did a, a uh, mixed model of, of variation, and we looked at each data point, so at values at each uh, time point, and we also looked through, which was what happened over the uh, full uh, six cycles. And you can see that uh, over the study that uh, there was a trend in our through data for a uh, difference um, at, uh, at six months. Uh, and the, the generally what we found is that the absolute difference uh, was somewhere between 0 0.8 and 1. And when we looked at the per, the, uh, per protocol population, actually um, that turned out to be statistically significant uh, at the through data. Uh, at the uh, at the day 161, so it was quite consistent, uh, and we were constantly seeing this about a 0.8 to one uh, percentage difference. Now, uh, we did have some dropouts, and we wanted to make sure that uh, the results we were seeing, particularly in the intention to treat group, uh, were not due to these dropouts and missing data. So we performed uh, two types of uh, sensitivity analyses. One was randomable multiple imputation, which is uh, where we put in uh, random values for each uh, missing value. Uh, and then we also did a second one where we actually jigged it to uh, disadvantage the LAU7B group uh, by replacing their missing points by worst case 
uh, imputation. And as you can see in the table, that uh, this did not affect the outcomes. And in, in fact, because the sample time became uh, larger because we didn't have missing data, the values in some cases became uh, more significant. So we also, as I said, mentioned we had predefined uh, subgroups and we did in our overall analysis see that there was some difference between those who had an FEV1 above 70% and those that had an FEV1 less than 70%. And it's actually in our group who started off with initial FEV1 above 70% that we saw a, uh, a difference. It wasn't statistically significant, but you can see that the sample size, but there, there was a difference. Similarly, if you are taking modulators, um, and yes, uh, I hate to disappoint you, but people on modulators can lose lung function. I know, I know it's, it's a, right. I know it's, it's right. like spitting, <laughs> spitting in church. It's okay. Yeah, but, let's talk about it. <laughs> okay, uh, but but we did see that, and uh, yet there was there was a separation uh, with the LAU group uh, staying stable. And even when we looked at our trichafta group, uh, although the difference was uh, smaller. Uh, we did see a similar difference with the uh, group on LAU uh, 7B uh, maintaining function better than those who were in the placebo group. So when we look at the, the uh, group overall, uh, we do see that in, both in the intention to treat and in the per protocol population that we see, saw a significant decrease in the loss of lung function, so less, less loss of lung function. And when we looked at our subgroups, we can see that this held true in all of our subgroups, those who had initial if you want above 70%, those who are taking any type of CF terra modulator, and those who are taking trikafta. So in all situations, there was less loss of lung function uh, in, uh, in the treatment group. In terms of exacerbations, um, just like all of us have witnessed, and this study started before uh, before COVID, uh, then we ran into the double whammy of COVID and people starting trikafta. Uh, and uh, so not surprising, just like what you're seeing, our overall incidence of pulmonary exacerbations, whether we looked at IV treated exacerbations alone or oral, tre oral treated or a combination of oral or IV, uh, there really was no difference. Similarly, we didn't see a difference in the number of days of antibiotics received, whether it was uh, oral antibiotics or IV antibiotics or IV only. We did a variety of inflammatory marker outcomes, and actually what we saw is in, in two markers that are you know, routinely used, uh, both uh, C-reactive protein and calprotectin, uh, that the LAU7B group stayed stable but uh, the placebo group actually, over the course of the six months, had an increase in their values. In terms of safety, you'll see that overall, the treatment emergent uh, adverse events was higher uh, in, the, in the active group. Um, and that includes uh, those that uh, are possibly or probably related uh, to study growth. And most of that is related to ocular uh, um, side effects. We, Fenret and I had a long experience being used in cancer patients. When we went into the trial, we were expecting that there might be uh, complaints of ocular symptoms, mostly uh, light or darkness adaptation, and also dry skin. So we went into that, and we specifically uh, queried and questioned about that, and I'll go into that in the next trial. Uh, study, uh, slide. So here's, here is the ocular events. And what we saw is, yes, in the active group, we did see more events. We, we, patients were queried at every visit. So they were sort of predisposed. They were asked about any, any symptoms related to uh, adaptation going into the light or adaptation when the lights are turned off. Um, so they were somewhat predisposed to that, but we purposely did that. Um, there were regular scheduled ophthalmologic exams, and any ophthalmologic uh, symptom that was, that was reported uh, triggered actually extra ophthalmological exams. 
And what we saw is that most of the complaints happened uh, in the first cycle. These uh, complaints were generally transient. You can see that uh, in the, in the uh, lower table that um, there were uh, 24 uh, complaints that triggered ophthalmologic examinations. Uh, only three of those, there was something found they did, uh, they did light dark adaptation uh, electrophysiology um, and they only found uh, that it corresponded in three patients and those were mild and transient. <coughs> in terms of the schedule of ophthalmologic uh, examinations, uh, it was really quite equal. There were three uh, in the active group and two in the, uh, in the placebo group who f had some uh, findings on, uh, on exam. Uh, but again, they were mild and they were transient. So to summarize, LAU7B does reduce uh, lung function loss at six months uh, when we measure it as a change in percent predicted FEV1. And this reached uh, statistical significance for the uh, per protocol population. There seemed to be greater benefit in those who had an FEV1 greater than or equal to the 70% at baseline. And it seemed to be maintained uh, even if you were on modulators, including uh, Trikafta. Uh, the results passed our robustness test with, in terms of sensitivity analysis. Despite this being quite a heterogeneous adult population, 40 to 70 percent of FEV1, uh, real life standard of care, the only drug that we verified they were taking was the active drug. Uh, we didn't verify that they were taking uh, their Trikafta, et cetera. Uh, and the uh, effects of the uh, of pandemic. Um, there was an acceptable safety profile, uh, and while though we had a higher incidence of treatment emergent adverse events in, the, uh, in our active arm, these were largely due to self-reported uh, ocular events, and those were mild and transient and generally not seen uh, when we went for actual ophthalmological examination. There were no life-threatening uh, uh, adverse events uh, and no SUSARS to report. And overall, in terms of looking at, so what are we going to look at in terms of outcomes going forward, uh, the data really supports that we should use percent predicted FV1 as a primary efficacy uh, variable uh, for confirmatory studies uh, with a longer treatment uh, duration. So with that, I, I really would like all to thank all the patients who participated. I'd like to thank the uh, site coordinators and the site PIs. Uh, this was, took quite a while and an achievement. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, the other investigators uh, in the trial. And we'll go to questions. Thank you for that talk. It was excellent. And I think uh, having just seen the plenary and how uh, FEV1 is going to be a challenging endpoint, especially in the people with higher lung function on uh, CFTR modulators, good luck. Um, but um, I, I had a few questions here from the app. Um, one of them was, what do you make of the slightly higher rate of pulmonary exacerbations in the, in the treatment arm? Yeah, we looked at that. I mean, um, it, it wasn't statistically significant. When we looked at, you know, number of days of treatment, it didn't differ. Um, sample size was, was small. There were, weren't many events. And so uh, we did not feel that there was a significant signal. Obviously, when you get into the world of, I won't call this anti-inflammatory, but inflammatory resolution and people being worried that you might suppress something, um, certainly, we, we, we actually thought, and we, you know, we designed the study to pick patients who had previous exacerbations, mm -hmm. so we're more likely. So one of our big surprises was that we didn't have a lot of exacerbations, but um, we don't feel that that's really a, of statistical significance or of any clinical significance. Great. And um, if the effect was biggest in those with the FEV1 over 70%, uh, should, should you do LCI instead? Well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, I think there's a few uh, measures uh, that could be done uh, in the next round. 
Uh, I agree, FEV1, especially when it's really high, is not going to change all that much. Um, uh, in the adult patient population, maybe a little more, but yes, LCI is one possibility. Uh, perhaps using MR, func functional MR is another possibility. Uh, I'll wave a flag for oscillometry. But there are some alternatives besides just spirometry, yes. Uh, and then I had one question um, about the per protocol uh, group instead of the randomized group. And so what, what were the biggest differences in those per protocol patients? And why do you think people didn't do the five cycles? Um, occasionally there were patients who had GI syndrome. Most of the patients dropped out for other reasons. Um, COVID, or they had the opportunity to go on Trikafta, so they came out because you have to be on modulator to get into the trial. Uh, there were several who, for personal reasons, just didn't feel like going through the whole six months. So that was the majority. There were a few who uh, dropped out um, because of they didn't feel that they were tolerating all that well, but that wasn't common. Uh, we had uh, two patients who withdraw one. Um, they had ophthalmologic symptoms. It was not confirmed by the ophthalmologic exam, but uh, the treating physician felt that the patient should come off, so they came off. And the other one had an exacerbation, and the physician felt that it was possibly related to study drug, and uh, they were taken off then. So, but the majority came off for other reasons. The one, one other question was um, whether any other biomarkers of inflammation were collected besides the CRP and So, uh, so, so we did a whole slew. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> yeah, uh, and we did the usual suspects, I, I should say. Okay. Um, and um, most of them um, did not change, but I will tell you that most of them were quite low at baseline. Uh, certainly, we actually noticed just this is what's been shown by other people, that those who came in on Trikafta actually even started off lower. Okay. Um, but even overall, the group um, looked better than what's been published before. And I think some of that you know, is also related to COVID. Um, as we know, everyone was locked away, yeah. didn't get that nice viral stimulation on a regular basis. Yeah. And I think that helped to calm some of the inflammatory markers that we were used to seeing it at a higher level in the population, especially this adult population. Yeah, there's, there's one question here um, uh, about, um, first of all, he says uh, he applauds the applaud study. So yeah. um, thank you. Uh, have there been prior studies of the effects of other anti-inflammatories that we use, like azithromycin or ibuprofen, during the CFTR modulation era where we could have this kind, you know, this kind of a, a, a study design? I think you're the first. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, the Zitro studies were all done, before. you know, all done way before. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's still patients on Zitro. I don't know if anyone's looking at whether right. there's an effect of Is that. Is there someone looking at that? Go ahead. Do the question. A, a, oh, okay. Okay, so... What happens is, because it's a retinoic acid derivative, it will lower your vitamin A. And actually, where we saw ha having its biggest effect was in the first cycle. And that probably accounts for why people had some complaints of, uh, of light and dark adaptation. Then it seems that their liver kicked in, and so that repeat other cycles, um, they didn't have that drop anymore. But that one week off allows you to recover your vitamin A level. And that had been shown both in healthy subjects and we saw that clearly in, in our population as well. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Were there other questions from the audience? Anyone else? If not, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And thank you for a great session, everyone.